Hi everyone um, and thank you Izzy for the introduction and thanks to everyone else who has come along tonight. Um, so I'm Emma and I will be giving you a little bit of an overview today of my journey with R, um, kind of how I got into it, where it's taken me and, and some sort of thoughts along the way. Um, so I will admit that when Izzy asked me if I wanted to speak, I was sort of in the middle of um, studying for, for some actuarial exams. Um, and also, you know, we've just hit 100 days in lockdown. So I wasn't, um, didn't feel like a highly technical talk was something I could sort of pull together at this point in time. So I thought it would be quite nice to maybe just have something that's a little bit more high level. Um, and hopefully you guys enjoy that as well. All right, so this is a little bit of an overview of uh, my journey with R. So um, I started using R at university, um, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about in a second. Um, I had a slightly unconventional path at uni. And while I was there, I sort of decided that I should probably learn some more R. Um, so I started teaching myself R outside of uni using sort of online courses. Um, and then that led me to working as an actuarial analyst. Um, I don't expect you guys to know what that means. <laughs> um, so I, I'll go into a bit of detail around what that means and how we, how we use R in that context. And then throughout all of that, I've been sharing my work online, which has been really useful for me, hopefully interesting for others. Um, and it's led to some really interesting opportunities including a little bit of data journalism, um, which is something I've been dabbling in for the past few months. So that's an overview of what I'll be going through today. So when I um, started at uni, I was actually a psychology major. Um, and as part of that, I uh, was you know, obligated to take a first year statistics course um, and I really enjoyed that course. I got really good marks, um, which is not super common in psychology students. I actually ended up tutoring a lot of psychology students because there are many who really dislike statistics. So a bit of a niche business opportunity for me. Um, but yeah, I, I started off in psychology and sort of added statistics courses to the point where I had a double major. Um, and it, it sort of became clear to me that the stuff we were using R for in statistics was quite niche and specific. So we would be asked, you know, assignments would be asking us, you know, find, you know, plot the F distribution of this and then find the P value. And, you know, it was very statistical and the data that was given to us was always very clean. Um, so there was not a lot of data processing. We weren't learning any of those skills. Um, and it was, yeah, it was pretty much pure statistics with no kind of data wrangling involved. And I, as I started to, you know, think about how I wanted to use, how I, the kind of work I wanted to do after university, which was, um, I was thinking around data science and data analytics. Um, it became obvious to me that that was not going to be sufficient in preparing me for that work. So I basically went online, found some courses, um, and you know, I would I would learn a little skill and then I would go away and, and find a data set out in the wild. Um, and then I would kind of replicate the exercise that I had learned in this online course um, using, you know, real data and sort of data that is often more messy. Um, so that was my learning process in terms of how I tried to learn the skills, not only of, you know, statistics, um, but also data processing and um, all of the things that go along with that. So that was, that was really, um, that was really interesting and useful. Um, and then I was nearing the end of my degree and the careers counselor at Victoria University said to me, Emma, you should apply for this job. I think this job would, you know, you would be really good at it. And I was like, 
an act a what <laughs> um and she was referring to a an actuarial consulting role um and i couldn't even pronounce actuarial um and most people when i tell them what i do that's sort of how they react so i wasn't really sure what an actuary was um i certainly had no intention of becoming one and um i remember actually when the company that I now work for came to Victoria University to do a careers event. Uh, I decided to go to a yoga class that night, so I didn't I didn't go to the presentation they gave, but I did apply for the job. Um, and I, you know, I looked into kind of what an actuary is. Um, and basically what we do as actuaries is we do risk analysis for insurance companies. So that there are sort of three main categories that we think about risk analysis um, or you know three main areas of work that we we work in so the first one is pricing which is basically um, deciding how much you should charge a customer for any any insurance product um, so that's obviously around the risk of the customer but there's also other considerations like competitive position profit um, things like that. Um, and then we've got reserving, which is about how much money the insurance company should hold on to for claims that um, have either not yet happened or have happened but haven't yet been processed. Um, and then capital is around the insurance company's investing strategy. So most of the stuff that I do that involves R is in the pricing space, and it's probably one of the areas that I'm most interested in. Um, so that's where sort of more of the data analytics um, skills come into play in terms of assessing someone's risk, whether that is for motor insurance um, or home insurance or any, you know, any kind of insurance product, and then determining how much we should be charging that company, uh, sorry, that customer. So here are a couple of examples where I used R on some pricing projects. Um, so on the left, we've got a New Zealand example. So that is a um, map of Thames. So this part here is the sea. And then you've got kind of the township of Thames here. This is the big flood plain. Um, and you, you can see the, the raster. So the black and white image is the background shows that this is very low down and then you've got some hills that kind of go up uh, and you've got two rivers that two main rivers um, that go into the floodplain in Thames and then you've also got this small river up here that goes through the mountains. Um, so Thames is a high risk area for flood for a number of reasons um, because of the rivers the very flat uh, floodplain and you also do get the effect of the sea coming in, especially when you've got king tides. So we were interested in uh, assessing the flood risk and then pricing home insurance accordingly. So we would take into account things like the elevation of the property, the distance to the river, the distance to the coast, the elevation between the house and the, um, you know, the river or the, the coastline. Um, and yeah, I think those were the sort of the main things we, we looked at. So all of those calculations were something that I did in R using some of the geospatial packages um, to extract, for example, the elevation of the house from the raster um, to calculate the distance to the river and so on. Um, and what you can see is that there is, there is quite a significant change as you move, you know, the sort of from one house, you sort of move a couple of houses down and the risk can really change, which you can see quite clearly here where you've got a bunch of houses that are yellow or orange, which indicates that there's a little bit higher risk. And then right next door, you've got a bunch of houses in green, which means that they're quite low risk. And that's because the elevation um, changes very rapidly in this particular area. So what that means is that um, if an insurer is rating, for example, at a postcode level, which is something that they very commonly do, they are aggregating that risk and um, 
they're charging those houses a very similar price um, and not differentiating between them. And obviously, if you're able to differentiate at a more granular level, then you're going to be able to offer a better price to those that are lower risk um, and then a higher price to those that are higher risk, which will mean that you'll probably get more customers from the low risk group because your, your premiums are more competitive. So that's why um, a lot of the, what we call natural perils pricing is moving to a very granular level, uh, which means at an address level away from this aggregate postcode or even regional council level um, rating, which is where a lot of insurers are at the moment. So that's um, where a lot of my R skills have been put to use sort of in the last three, almost four years while I've been working here. And I found it really interesting because, you know, you get to do some really cool stuff in R in terms of geospatial calculations and uh, which also, you know, you're, you're working with very large chunks of data. If you imagine a raster that covers all of New Zealand, um, you start to have to think about, you know, computational efficiency and, and how to run that without um, crashing everything and possibly pissing off your coworkers if you take their work down with you. Um, so that's flood in New Zealand. And then on the right, We've got um, an example of cul-de-sacs, which as I'm sure you guys know, are um, dead ends basically. And I was part of identifying these in Australia um, because they are used as a, a rating factor for um, theft. So if you live in a cul-de-sac, your theft risk is slightly lower because you have fewer people going through that area. So, um, you know, I guess your house isn't is likely to be to be robbed. Um, and you also have slightly higher fire risk because it's more difficult for fire engines to come into that cul-de-sac and often they won't go as far to, um, because they don't have access. So my job was to identify all of the cul-de-sacs in Australia, um, which, I, I really like this project. It was a lot of fun. Um, and again, it was all in R using geospatial techniques to basically identify which road segments did not overlap with another road segment. Because what I basically did is I extracted all of the, um, the endpoints of each road segment. Um, so every time two roads intersect, a new road segment begins. So if you think about, for example, here um, at this intersection, that's the end of this road segment, and then you've got other road segments beginning. And so what I would do is extract the endpoints and then basically test whether there is an intersection between that particular endpoint and any other endpoint. Um, and if there was, then that meant that the road continued. And if there wasn't, then that um, meant that it was what we call a dangle, um, which is basically a, a cul-de-sac. So you can see that uh, we've identified all of these red points as being cul-de-sacs. And this is in Adelaide, actually. Um, Alice Springs, sorry. Um, Alice Springs. So yeah, so those are sort of two projects that I worked on that involved R, both geospatial and nature. Um, I've also worked on projects that are a little bit more you know, traditional machine learning um, in R. The, the, the pictures aren't as cool, so I haven't got them here for you. But, you know, using, for example, um, you know, GBMs or GLMs to predict the, uh, the premium that we should be charging for a motor insurance policy, according to things like, you know, age, gender, um, what kind of car it is, how old the car is, how many kilometers are being driven, all of that kind of stuff. All right, so um, while I was working on, you know, these kinds of things at work, uh, one thing that I still consistently did even after I, I left uni was to share my work online. So that was mainly through Twitter for me. Um, there's a really 
great uh, community on Twitter. So if you are looking for somewhere to ask questions or um, get some advice or just share some stuff, I would really recommend it. And I actually remember the first time I ever shared anything from R, it was a, um, a bar chart that I made in ggplot, you know, default colors, <laughs> no changes made. And um, I can't remember what I said and I couldn't find the tweet, but um, Hadley Wickham retweeted me, which um, as I'm sure you guys know, he's sort of quite a big name in, in R. And that was really exciting for me. So it sort of showed me how, you know, welcoming this community was even to people who were very much beginners because at that, at that point in time, you know, that was literally the first plot that I made. Um, so that kind of set me off on a journey of continually sharing my work online. So one, one way in which I did this was through the 30 day map challenge, which if you're on Twitter at the moment, you probably have seen some really great maps coming out of that. So it was started in 2019 um, by Topi, I can't pronounce his last name, sorry. Um, and basically what it was, it was, it was a challenge to produce one map every day in November. Um, and the themes were set out for you. So you were given, for example, points or lines or polygons as a theme, and you could go away and make whatever you wanted based on that and share that online. And these are the themes for 2021, which are currently uh, going on. So if you haven't had a look at them, I highly recommend it because I think every year the quality sort of gets better. Um, so I, in 2019, I decided to be part of it. So I did try and share one map every day in, in November. Um, and so here are a couple of examples. So one of the maps I did was looking at the most and least active cats in New Zealand. So this was from, uh, this was using data in Wellington where they, they tracked the movements of cats for the purposes of um, basically preventing them from, you know, um, attacking native birds and killing them. So they wanted to understand the movements of cats so that they could better sort of, I guess, you know, control that problem. Um, so I went and had a look at this data and, and found the, the cat that moved the most and the cat that moved the least. And so on the left, we've got Blue Nelson, who on average, he would wander around 3.9 kilometers per day. And then on the right, we've got Tasha, who only moved 42 meters per day. So basically stayed in, you know, between the couch and maybe her food bowl. Um, so that was one one fun map I made. Another one was looking at the most popular breeds and names of dogs owned in New Zealand. So um, on the left, we've got the male dogs. And then on the right, we've got the female dogs. And so you can see that Labrador retrievers are extremely popular. And um, for males, the most common name was Cooper. And for females, it was Bella. And then we had a couple of other breeds that also made it into the mix. So Border Collies, Fox Terriers, Collies, and then Jack Russell Terriers in Nelson, which is actually where I'm from. <laughs> um, and so I actually, I mentioned this to my dad and he was like, oh yeah, it's, it's all the old people are living in Nelson. They all have a Jack Russell. So um, I, I don't know if that's true, but yeah. So those were sort of two fun things that I that I did, and there were a whole bunch of other maps that I shared as well. And so this really showed me how important and how um, you know amazing it could be to share your work with other people and kind of get feedback in real time. Because obviously, you know, you would share something and people would kind of respond to it, and some things were more popular than others, and um, one thing I noticed is that some of the maps that I put the most work into didn't kind of land as well as the other ones, or the, some of the maps that, that, that I put, you know, much less work into. Um, and so it sort of got me thinking about kind of communicating your results to a 
a lay audience and possibly um yeah sort of thinking about things from their perspective and, and how they can connect to your work and how you know what makes it interesting from their point of view because it's not it's not how much work you put into it um so yeah that was sort of a skill that i started developing in this in this process all right so then um earlier this year i um i was homesick and i saw a map um I saw a map of the US online and it was about the housing market in the US and it basically said how much do you need to earn to be able to afford a house in your state um, and I was like oh I could I could make that for New Zealand so even though I've gone homesick um, I'm, I'm not very not very good at kind of you know knowing when not to work so so I started looking into the data and I, I pulled this together and basically what it is, is it's taking this common piece of financial advice that says that you should only spend about 30% of your gross income on housing and, and then that would be considered to be affordable, um, which is to say it would leave you with enough money to hopefully meet your other needs. So what I did is I looked at the housing market in New Zealand and I basically did that calculation. So if you had a 20% deposit, um, a mortgage at an interest rate at 4% and a 30 year term, how much would you need to earn in each of these regions to only be spending 30% of your gross income on your mortgage? So these were the numbers that came out of it. And um, obviously Auckland is the highest, but even some of the other areas are pretty, pretty high. So I shared this on, on Twitter um, and it really took off. So people were really, really interested in this. Um, and, you know, I, I started getting calls from journalists about it. Um, it kind of spread off Twitter. I started, get, you know, I started seeing it pop up on Facebook, which is not somewhere that I um, would share my work to usually and it was it was really taking off people were really um, engaged with this map so I also did a similar one for renting so this is the average rent and obviously there's no deposit involved but this is the amount that you would need to earn to um, be spending 30 percent of your gross income on your on your rent and in some ways I actually think this this one's a little bit more alarming um because you know you don't really have an alternative to renting if you can't afford a mortgage and you know most 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 of the regions the median income is less than what we're seeing here and i did actually do a map on that as well so this really took off and started spreading and journalists started picking up on it and it was actually shown to megan woods who's the housing minister on news hub um, so if you look really closely, you can see my name on this map. <clears throat> so it was it was shared there. Um, it was also covered in a few articles. And just for fun, I thought I would also include this email that I got from someone um, who basically said, you know, great article, but what you probably don't realize is that the blame must be placed squarely at the feet of that small group of malcontents called feminists. As a young woman, having lived your whole life in the dark shadow of feminist dogma, you might not agree with this, but believe me, it's 100% true in every regard, and we deny it at our peril. So when I got this mess, it was, that's one small part of their email, which was about this long. Um, when I got this email, I was like, oh, now I'm a real journalist. <laughs> like people are sending me, you know, messages about how the housing market is because of feminism. Um, so that was quite funny and it was actually written by a woman as well so I don't know that was a strange experience so as I said um, following on from from having, you know sharing this map online it was shared with with the housing minister it was also put into a report by the Helen Clark Foundation 
on the post-pandemic future of New Zealand. So how New Zealand um, would have to adapt to the fact that more New Zealanders were coming home and potentially interested in buying property. Um, so I worked with them on including the, these maps as part of their report. And then the spin-off reached out and I and asked me if I wanted to write about it. Um, and so I did that. I, I wrote, I think, two, two articles um, based on these maps. So one about mortgages and one about renting. And um, at that point, they said to me, you know, we would like to have you write on a more regular basis. So I started writing for them on a semi-regular sort of fortnightly basis on basically, you know, any kind of data-driven topic. So they, they sort of said, you know, you can pick anything that you're interested in, um, do, do some analysis on it, run it past us and see whether it works and we'll publish it. So um, I really liked the, the writing part in conjunction with the, uh, the visualization. So I, you know, it was sort of a, a new way of communicating for me. So um, yeah, I was, I was keen and, and so we set that up. And since then I've written on quite a few different topics. So um, I've looked at COVID transmission and, and some risk factors in different um, employment situations. So that's based on a, a database of things like um, physical proximity to others, whether it's a face-to-face -face job, whether you're dealing with external customers and um, whether you're working indoors. So I basically, found a database that had all of these characteristics rated for uh, most jobs and looked at how that kind of compared with the most common jobs in New Zealand. Um, then I also had a look at baby names. This was more of a fun piece. Um, so, you know, how common baby names are and how that's changed over time. Um, how much people generally spend on certain things that we couldn't access in lockdown. And then I also did some work on student loans and how um, paying back a student loan might be different for someone based on their ethnicity and the and the and and gender and how much they tend to earn um, on average. So as part of my um, work with the spin-off, I actually moved away from doing visualizations in R and started doing them in um, data wrapper which is what you've what you can see on the right and flourish which is what you can see on the left mainly because it was a lot easier for the spin-off to embed those data visualizations into their website um, and it also allows you to make interactive data visualizations so um, I mean these are just images that I've pasted in but if you are actually on the website you can you know click on or hover over a particular data point and see more detail on that and there are ways in which you can get a little bit fancier and make more interactive visualizations as well um i i've kept things pretty simple for now but um yeah it sort of worked better for that environment and um the quality of the visualize like the the crispness of the visualization also seemed to be better as well so that's been sort of interesting, um, moving away from doing my visualiz visualizations in R, which is where I've been doing most of that for a while. Um, so yeah, there's been a little bit of a learning curve there, but I also think it's been really good to, um, yeah, be able to access that interactivity without, I know that there are ways you can do that using things like D3, but I'm, I'm not at the point where I sort of have enough time to invest in learning that. Um, and also the other thing that's been really good about learning about, about doing these kinds of visualizations is um, learning about maybe more mobile friendly design. So that was probably the feedback that I got the most from um, the spin-off, especially from Huck and Wall, who some of you might know he's, um, sort of their lead data person uh, now 
and he really emphasized to me how important it was that your visualizations translate well to mobile because that's where most of their traffic comes from. So that's been sort of a learning curve for me as well to um, stop thinking about people accessing my visualizations on you know a nice big screen and start thinking about how they're probably being accessed, which is often on quite a small um, screen that's sort of compressed in some ways. All right, so these are sort of the overall takeaways that I've been thinking about um, as I've been putting this together and reflecting on my time um, since I started working with R. So the first one is that you really should take advantage of all the help and all the support that's out there in, in the R community. So whether that's online or um, through meetups, which obviously can at one point happen in person now happen you know through through zoom but um having other people to sort of bounce your ideas off and see what they're doing and all of that is really useful and at times i've been pretty amazed at how much help i've gotten you know i've asked for very specific things um you know how do you scrape twitter for this particular thing and and you get the answer within five minutes sometimes. So that's really amazing. And I encourage people to um, become part of that community. So then the second thing I think is really important is learning how to communicate your findings through words as well as images, which is probably what we do more often. Um, and I think there's value in sharing with both experts and with non-experts. So I think having a mix of you know who you're sort of showing your work to is really important because your experts will often give you very specific feedback about um you know i guess maybe your the metrics that you're showing or you know sort of more of the technical stuff and then the non-experts they will often give you more of a gut reaction which is probably a more accurate reflection of what the general public will um, be thinking when they look at your work so you know they might say like oh well this part doesn't really make sense or oh I thought you I thought you were highlighting this like it can be quite vague but I think there's actually a lot of value in hearing that because it is a better reflection of how people consume data visualizations which is to say in passing <laughs> um, they're not as invested in understanding it as most people are or as as you are and I think you really have to take that into account if you're wanting to share your work um, in a wider space or with, with more people. So then third thing would be put your name on stuff before you share it. I sort of learned that the hard way with the maps. Um, you know, I, I didn't put my name on them and I had, you know, they were on Facebook, they were on LinkedIn, they were on Reddit they were sort of making the rounds before um, I realized that I should have put my name on them because they were being shared outside of the context of my Twitter account. Um, and then there's also something about, you know, thinking about how you are and are not okay with your work being used. So when I, uh, when I made the maps and they started taking off, I had a lot of journalists approach me and and ask me whether they could use the maps in a piece of journalism. And I actually asked them for money um, and they, none of them took me up on it. <laughs> um, and some of them did end up linking to my tweet, which is fine, but I sort of thought, you know, if you're going to use the maps outside of just linking to my tweet, then, um, you know, I feel like there should be some compensation involved. And then when the spinoff approached me, that felt like much more of a sort of mutually beneficial relationship rather than, you know, some journalist taking the work that I've done and sort of running with it. So I think what I learned there is that you do get to have some say about where your work is used and, and the ways in which that happens. And, you know, don't be afraid to sort of um, stand up for that. 
And then finally, I would say, try making some visualizations outside of R. Um, just because it is a different way of thinking about things and there are some features that are easier in that environment compared to R. And I think that's really, uh, can be really beneficial. So if you have been following any of the, you know, news websites that have been doing some COVID visualizations, whether that's in terms of vaccination rates or case numbers or anything along those lines, um, you will have seen that those visualizations are generally made in Flourish or in Data Wrapper or something similar. So you can see that the um, news organizations are sort of picking up on that. And that's generally speaking, that's how they're um, embedding that kind of thing into their website. So if you're ever interested in working in that kind of an environment, then that would be a good um, skill to have. All right. I I feel like my voice is actually after you know being in lockdown for so long by myself I'm not used to talking this much so my voice is kind of going but um that's all I've got to share with you guys today so if you have any if you have any questions I'd be really happy to take them and see if I can answer any of them All right. So um, Izzy is asking where I look for data sets to use. So um, some of the data sets come from Statistics New Zealand. So they, they do have a pretty good, um, you know, breadth of data sets. Often it's quite aggregated, which is sometimes makes things difficult, but um, yeah, there's some interesting stuff in there and they also have a very good chat help service. So if, you, if you're if you trying to find something and you ask them, they generally know exactly where, the, where to point you. Um, and then also, I, I, get, I guess I just keep an eye out for interesting data sets and I sort of save them in a, in a folder that I've called cool fun data. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you see like, for example, that workplace characteristics data set that I used for the spin-off article was something that I saw you know maybe six months ago or something um, so I, I sort of just saved that somewhere that link and, and came back to it at that point um, so yeah it can be good to sort of start a little collection so then um, Nick asks what are some things that you consider when making something for mobile so I think this is an area that I'm still learning about um, and it can be a little bit tricky. So I guess one thing is you sort of want to keep things relatively simple because they are becoming smaller. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to know whether, you know, it's, well, as a, as a data visualization person, it can be tempting to tr sort of try something new or like want to do something new. Um, but sometimes it's actually better to do something simple that, you know, is less impressive, but kind of works in that environment as well. Um, and I would say always test it out. So actually go and, you know, get on your phone and have a look at what it looks like. Um, and yeah, when I, I was talking to Hakan Wall and he said like, oh, some people just have a crappy Android. And I was like, I have a crappy Android. This is perfect for testing. So um, yeah, just try it out and see whether things still make sense to you, whether you can, you know, how labels are showing up, that kind of thing. Um, so Amanda asks, what online courses did you use to learn R? And I think Shirley's got a similar question. So I actually used Data Camp, which... I'm not super comfortable recommending anymore because of a sexual harassment um, incident that took place inside that company and seemed to be handled pretty poorly. Um, so 
you know, when I when I used it, it was helpful. Um, but I I would it's not something I would recommend, generally speaking. Um, and I think whatever you use, there's there's still a lot of hand holding. Um, I think it's sort of I don't think you can write a course without having some degree of hand holding in terms of giving you clean data. So what I always recommend to people is find an online course, but also go and kind of replicate those exercises with data that you, you know, download from Stats NZ or, you know, Linz or wherever you wherever you can just get some real life data and then sort of go and do the do the same thing again. Um, because I think you'll learn a lot more in that process. All right. Um, Raphael asks, what's your thought process around how you decide how to visualize data or what visuals to use? So, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think often there's a lot of trial and error involved. So you sort of try something out and then you realize maybe it's not quite as effective or um, clear as, as you hoped. For example, if we go, so this particular graph here is looking at COVID transmission risk factors. So you can see the four characteristics that I looked at. And the, these are the um, some of the most common occupations in the, in the accommodation and food services industry in New Zealand. And I originally tried these, tried this visualization out as a um, sort of like a spider plot where each characteristic has, um, it's sort of a circle and then you have like your different axes and each axis is this characteristic. Um, and it just, it didn't work quite as well as I thought it would. And then when you look at it on mobile, um, you can only look at one occupation at a time in that format. So it sort of starts to lose its, you know, it's not quite as comparable. Because I think what's interesting here is that, for example, you can see a kitchen hand is much lower risk than a cafe and restaurant manager. Um, and I think that that ability to compare was quite important because these numbers don't mean a lot without, you know, that context. They are a score out of 400, but I think the, the ability to compare was quite important. So that's, you know, so some of the, that's a background basically of some of the thought process that goes into that. How do you keep the consistency to do data journalism outside of work? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, and I feel like the last couple of weeks haven't been my best work, <laughs> um, mainly because I just had exams as part of becoming an actuary, we have to do exams. Um, and I, I feel like, yeah, it's been a little bit tricky to um, gather any kind of motivation since then. I've been in a little bit of a, a work-related funk. But um, generally speaking, I guess I really enjoy the work, which is obviously super helpful. And I always have heaps of questions. So there's always questions that I would like to answer, um, which again is, is motivational. But yeah, I think there is something about, you know, setting reasonable expectations, I guess. Um, the spinoff originally asked me if I would do something weekly. And I said to them, I, I don't think I can. Um, just the amount of work that goes into it. And then I, you know, obviously have a job. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes you have to sort of set reasonable expectations and then hopefully find something you enjoy to um, be able to keep that up. If we don't have any more questions, you can end it, but I'll give it an extra few seconds in case anyone has any last minute questions. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Emma. This is a fantastic presentation. I feel like somewhat motivated to do some some R work, which is much better than the last few months. So thank you. Um, and it seems like everyone in the chat is saying the same thing. So yeah, great job. And I hope everyone's doing all right. And I hope to see you all at our next meetup.
Awesome. Thank you so much to everyone who came. Really appreciate it. And thank you again, Izzy, for, for organizing and for asking me and for chasing up. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> cool. See ya.